I wonder when the first moment is in your life, if you can think back this far, when you realized that there are cool kids in the world and there are not cool kids in the world and uh, you were finally able to do the math to figure out which one of those categories uh, you fit into or what it was going to take from you in order to fit into one of those two or the better of those categories. I remember for me probably the first time it ever really dawned on me that there were cool kids and not cool kids was somewhere around kindergarten and grade one. And I remember distinctly, it was the first time I realized that the Star Wars lunchbox is like an actual thing made by Thermos. This thing, to, to my little kindergarten or grade one mind, this was the distinguishing feature between the cool kids and the not cool kids. And I absolutely had to have one right around that time when I was in kindergarten grade one also in my world one massively distinguishing feature between the cool kids and the not cool kids were the kids that owned the game Rock'em Sock'em Robots um this was like my favorite game in the world my cousins had it I was insanely jealous and in my mind that was just the coolest toy on the entire planet but these criteria for coolness they always change right they're always evolving and you got to try and keep up. So, uh, you know, a few years later, as I get a little bit further into public school, the cool kids, one of the ways to tell was that they were all wearing parachute pants. You know, thank you, Michael Jackson. These are pants made out of parachute material with zippers all over them for a reason known only to God himself. But sometime after the parachute pants came the kids in the zebra pants. Thank you, NFL. Uh, for that product. I owned both of those outfits, uh, by the way. Um, somewhere in there, in between the parachute pants and the zebra pants, all the cool kids were doing their hair like this. They were doing their hair in spiky mohawks. You will be surprised to learn that I never fit that category of cool. In fact, those kids, let's be honest, they were definitively trying not to be cool, and they were cool in spite of themselves. Um, as you went along, in the, when it came to music, all the cool kids were carrying ghetto blasters. Right, Because you needed something that you had to carry with two hands to listen to your cassette tapes you know, when you weren't in the house. Although uh, shortly after that time, the ghetto blasters disappeared and all the cool kids were wearing Walkman. Because you could listen to your cassette tape uh, and keep your hands free. And that seemed like a pretty cool thing. The whole point is that all the way through our childhood, all the way through your growing up years, there were criteria of what it meant to be cool and not cool, and you knew who was in and who wasn't in. You knew who had it and who didn't. And the sad reality that I've been reflecting on this week is that exactly the same thing is true in the church. We're coming back to the gospel according to Matthew this morning. We're turning to Matthew chapter 19, and we're picking up the conversation Right where we left it off last June at the end of Matthew chapter 18, where Jesus was talking about what it means to be the church, or more specifically, he was talking about what it doesn't mean to be the church. We, we were talking about the five deadly sins of church, that what threatens the church's existence is not anything from culture on the outside, it's what we do on the inside, like seeking status instead of being humble. Like being inconsiderate of the ways that our lives affect the people around us, especially spiritually. Instead of being sensitive to that. Like um, being indifferent to people who drift away from faith or from community. um, Instead of proactively going and getting them. Talked about things like tolerating conflict as a, one of the five deadly sins is tolerating conflict instead of being a community of reconciliation or withholding forgiveness, a, a grudge bearing community instead of being a community of forgiveness. And as we turn to Matthew chapter 19, Jesus, I think, is continuing the conversation about what it means to be church, but this time less about exploring some of the external dynamics of that and more digging into the internal motivations of the root of this entire thing, which is status seeking. And so we turn to Matthew chapter 19, starting in verse 1. This whole thing begins with a conversation that Jesus has with the religious leaders. It says this, 
When Jesus finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. And some Pharisees came to him to test him. And they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Now, Matthew's being right up front that this conversation on the part of the religious leaders is meant to be a test of Jesus. They're asking Jesus for his opinions about divorce, not because they care about his opinion. In fact, they already know his opinion. In, back in Matthew chapter 5, verse 31 and 32, Jesus talks about his opinion about marriage and divorce. And we talked about this a uh, couple of years ago. No, they, they already know his opinion. They're coming to Jesus because they're trying to get him into a conversation that's going to alienate him from the crowds of people that are following him. following him. Ultimately, what they're trying to do is they're trying to trap Jesus to say something that violates the religious sensibilities of these Jews who follow the Jewish religious law and disenchants them with Jesus, makes them just sort of give up on following him. Actually, their motivations might even be more sinister than that because it says that they cross to the other side of the Jordan, which means that they're having this conversation in a part of the country called Perea, where Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, was actually arrested, imprisoned, and ultimately executed because he publicly denounced the divorce of King Herod Antipas as illegitimate. This was a part of the country where having the wrong opinion about divorce can get you killed. And so they bring to Jesus this debate. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? They're really they're asking Jesus to weigh in on a conversation that the rabbis were having about how to interpret one specific passage in the Old Testament Jewish religious law. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1, and it says this. It says, let's say a man marries a woman, but she isn't pleasing to him because he's discovered something inappropriate about her. So he writes up divorce papers, hands them to her, and sends her out of his house. Now, um, the rabbis, basically, this, this passage is actually part of a larger hypothetical scenario. It says, let's say that a man does this, uh, and he divorces this woman, and she goes and marries someone else, and then that guy divorces the woman. She's having a tough go of it. And uh, the whole law is, this, the first husband can't marry this wife after she's been married to somebody else. That's the actual command. Right? But the rabbis got caught up in trying to discern from this passage what the legitimate grounds for divorce ought to be according to the religious law. And there were three schools of thought. Rabbi Shammai focused on this phrase, something inappropriate. In the, in the Hebrew, it's erwa debar. And it literally means an issue of shamefulness or an issue of nakedness. And, and Rabbi Shammai focused on that and said, okay, the grounds of divorce have to be something shameful. And since the word shameful is related to the word naked, he said this has to be something sexual, sexually inappropriate behavior. Not just having an affair, but um, if a woman goes out with her hair down, which was never, never, the only person who saw you with your hair down was your husband. Jewish women always wear their hair up. Um, if you expose your armpits, because once you've exposed your armpit, you're close to exposing some other things, right? Um, all baths in the ancient world were taken in public places if you bathe in mixed company. If you behave in a sexually inappropriate way, that's grounds for divorce. That was Rabbi Shammai. Rabbi Hillel says, no, no, no. He says, you're not reading it right. He looked at the same phrase, this issue of shamefulness, and another way to read the Hebrew is an issue or shamefulness. He says there's actually two criteria. Yeah, it could be all this sexually inappropriate stuff, but it could just be an issue. It could be that your marriage has an issue that's just not going away. And if it has an issue, like let's say, and this is the literal example that he gives, let's say your wife keeps burning your food. Well, that is an issue, and you shouldn't put up with that, and you can divorce her for that. It was a much more liberal perspective. Well, Rabbi Akiba came along and said, no, no, you guys are both reading the passage all wrong. And he focused on the word pleasing. She isn't pleasing to him. And Rabbi Akiba says, if, if you just don't like her anymore, or literally, his, his example is, if another woman walks by and she's just prettier than your wife, and you're like, oh, I want to be married to her and not her. Well then, give her a certificate of divorce and send her away. And the, and the Pharisees are coming to Jesus. This is a well-known debate, and they're like, okay, Jesus, where do you land 
on the issue of an appropriate grounds for divorce. And Jesus' response to them is, well, it doesn't really matter where I land. It matters where you begin. In verse 4, he says, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Jesus says, guys, you're coming about this conversation all wrong. Instead of debating the technical interpretation of the legalese in Deuteronomy 24, why don't we go back to first principles? And let's look at what marriage was supposed to be from the beginning. Because in the very first chapter of the Bible, it says that God created the man and the woman. That's how the rabbis were reading that passage in Jesus' day. They, They didn't read it as men in general and women in general. They read it as God created the man and the woman, Adam and Eve, the first couple in the story that the Bible tells about human origins. And and so God creates the man, and and there's actually one commentary that says God created the man and his mate. That's that's how you know they're talking about Adam and Eve. Um, He says, let's say God created Adam and Eve and then brought them together in marriage and he joined them together. The word means like fused or glued them together. We could say God welded them together. He took two separate entities and fused them together into a single new entity. There's still two parts, but there's just one piece. There's one entity. And Jesus says that's how God does marriage. When God does marriage, he takes two Two people, and he fuses them together into a single entity. So if that's what God does, fusing people together, why are we having debates about what it'll take to pull them apart? Why not talk about what it'll take to keep them together? Well, the Pharisees think, well, now we've got them. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Right? Hey, okay, if that's true, Jesus then why did Moses command us to divorce our wives? Right, to write the certificate of divorce, because that's how you get a divorce in ancient Israel. There's no divorce court, there's no lawyers, there's no judges, there's no negotiations, there's no waiting period, there's no nothing. You, if you want to get a divorce, the husband, because only a man can initiate the proceedings, the husband gets a piece of paper and he writes a note that says, Uh, Let this be for me to you a certificate of divorce for such and such a reason and you're free to go marry whoever you want and you date it, you sign it and you get two or three witnesses to sign it and you give it to your wife and that's it. She's done. Out the door you go. It's that easy. There are people in all three of our locations thinking if it were only that easy, right? But that was the whole point. In ancient Israel, divorce was quick and easy. It was simple if you were a guy and... um, No fuss, no muss, and really no one thought it was a big deal. In fact, among the Pharisees, it was an open secret that they were getting divorces all the time. And so they said, why would Moses command us? Why would he tell us how to do it if you're not supposed to do it? Jesus replies, verse 8, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Jesus comes down in this position that's actually stricter even than Rabbi Shammai. He says, listen, this is, Moses didn't command you to do anything. He permitted you to do this because your hearts were hard and he forced you to write a certificate of divorce as a legal protection for your wife because in the ancient world, women can't survive as singles. You can't work. There's no social safety net. There's no insurance or whatever. The only way you can survive as a woman is to be attached to a man. And so if you're going to divorce your wife, Moses says, at the very least, you have to write her a certificate of divorce so that she can hand it to a future husband and say, see, I'm legally allowed to marry. And they can go. It was for her protection to save her from poverty. That's why the command existed. But Jesus says, that's not the point. The point is, if anyone divorces their spouse, except for marital unfaithfulness, that is just not what God intended. Now, time out and hear me say this. Because I know there are people in all three of our locations who have divorced their spouses for reasons other than marital unfaithfulness. And I don't want you looking down. I don't want your eyes to go to the floor. I don't want you to feel shame. Listen to me. Whatever's in your past has been covered by the cross of Jesus Christ. You've been forgiven. 
He has taken and whatever that is, not even just marriage and divorce, whatever it is in your past, Jesus has taken it from you, separated it from you as far as the east is from the west. He's taken it, thrown it in the bottom of the ocean. He doesn't even remember it anymore. These are things that the Bible says the, you know, the forgiveness is total and complete. God looks at you and he sees a righteous person, a brand new human being. And your point, your life is not to be lived out of your past. Your life is to be lived in the present by the power of the Holy Spirit, looking to the future that God has for for you. So whatever it is that sits behind you, let's look forward and ask, what does God have for me next? Okay? That's all we're going to say about the divorces that have happened in this community. Because, at least in part, because that's true, and because this text isn't really about marriage and divorce. It's about what the disciples say next. The disciples said to Jesus, if this is the situation between a husband and a wife, it's better not to marry. The disciples are blown away. Jesus draws this wickedly hard line on divorce. He says, listen, you can basically never divorce. You got to stay together unless one of you cheats on the other. You know, and that's not really the Bible's teaching about marriage and divorce, but that's for another day. Um, this is what they hear, and they say, if that's true, that once I commit to a woman, I like, can't get out of it, that once I've said yes to a woman, then I'm stuck with this woman for all the rest of my life. It's, it's just better to be single. Do, do you hear the hard attitude in what they're saying? Really what they're saying to Jesus is this. Look, Jesus, I am a man in Jewish society. And as a man in Jewish society, I have certain rights and privileges that belong to me. And one of the rights and privileges that is afforded to me by the way the law is interpreted in our society is that I have the right to get rid of my wife whenever I want. She's lower than me in the ranking, right? I'm a more important person than her, and I can get rid of her whenever I want. This was really, honestly, Jewish men really did look down on on Jewish women. In fact, every morning in the Jewish synagogue, one of the prayers that Jewish men would pray is, you know, thank you, God, for not creating me as a woman, a slave, or a Gentile. I'd hate to be those people, but I get to be a man. And one of the rights and privileges that I have as a man is deciding what happens to my marriage. My wife has no say. She's just a piece of property. I can sell her like a used civic. Um, but I get to say what happens in my marriage. What was going on in the disciples and the reason they responded to Jesus the way they did was because they were very aware of where they rank in society and they were very aware of the privileges that afforded them and they were very interested in protecting those privileges whatever the cost. I'd rather be single and violate the sacred duty before God that every Jew has to get married and have kids. I'd rather be single than to live as a man but not have my rights. And the reason that's so significant and the centerpiece of the entire text is this. We still do that in the church. Have our own little social hierarchy based on certain criteria that we establish relatively arbitrarily so that we know even within the church community who matters more and who matters less. Right? We, we, know, we know, I mean, just look at the, 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 the stuff in this passage, right? We grade people in the church based on their marital status, right? People who are married and have children, for some reason in the community of faith, uh, get the impression that they're worth more than people who are married without kids who are somehow less, or people who aren't married, singles, or widowers, or the divorced. Right? We know where we rank. Think about it in terms of gender, which is an issue in the text. I'm a man, and I have the right to get rid of this woman who I outrank. I'm more, and she's less. The church has, for way too long, ranked people based on gender, where some how, for some reason, men matter more in the community. They're more significant to the life of the community than women. The church has always done that, and we're trying to fix that as far as our community is concerned at Southridge, so that men and women are the same. But 
Ask a woman whether they've ever felt like less in the community of faith. We do that in other words. We do it with spiritual maturity. Well, I've been around longer, and you've been around for less time. I'm a more mature Christian. You are a new believer. Um, I know more of my Bible. You know less of your Bible. I have better theology. You have worse theology. We have ways of ranking each other in terms of our spirituality. We do it in even uglier ways. Even within the church, we rank each other based on wealth on the money that somebody makes, and maybe more importantly at times, the money that somebody gives. The big donors are treated like more, and the people who give less are treated like less. We do it based on health, right? Those who are healthy and in good physical condition, they're worth more. The sick, the disabled, those persons who battle physical or mental disabilities, intellectual disabilities, mental illness, and so on. For some reason, those people are treated like less. We do it with age. The young, the vigorous, the energetic, they're worth more. The old are worth less. The beautiful are worth more. The plain are worth less. Those who are part of the dominant dominant ethnicity, the community, northern European complexions, are worth more, and the minorities are worth less. Those who don't conform to the normative sexual orientation in the church community, heterosexuality is normal, and they're considered more, and other orientations are in the minority, and they're considered less. And we have our ranking systems, and we have our ways of identifying where we sit in the community, and we're very aware of the reality that certain rights and privileges are supposed to accrue to our standing in the community. And it's exactly what Jesus deconstructs in his answers to the disciples. They say, well, listen, if that's true, that as a man, I don't even have the power to dispose of my wife, and it's better to not be married. Jesus replied, verse 11, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it's been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, and there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, and the one who can accept this should accept it. Now, throughout the church history, it's common to believe that what Jesus is saying is, you know what, you're right, you shouldn't be married, you should be single, and anybody who has the stomach for singleness for the sake of the kingdom should choose that. And I think that maybe that's one implication of what Jesus is saying, but I don't think that's the heart of it. Because If Jesus was saying that, why wouldn't he just do what the Apostle Paul does in another passage and say, no, you're right, you should be single, just look at me. I'm single, I devote my life to the kingdom of God, and everyone should do that like me if you can, and if not, get married, but don't feel bad about it. Um, But Jesus doesn't do that. He brings in this completely unnecessary conversation about eunuchs. Why does Jesus talk about eunuchs? Because eunuchs are people who live without categories. Right? Jesus talks about three kinds of eunuchs. He talks about those who were born that way. They're called eunuchs of the sun. In other words, from the very first moment that they were exposed to sunlight in their life, everyone could tell that they didn't fit the category of biologically male. Whether physiologically or psychologically, they somehow didn't conform to the ancient culture standard of masculinity. They were something other. There are those who were born that way. There are those who have been made eunuchs by others. He's talking about castration. This is actually where the language of eunuch comes from. In Hebrew, the word eunuch is related to the Babylonian word for king. In Greek, the word eunuch is the contraction of a phrase that means the one who guards the bed. And so you're combining those two concepts, what a eunuch was in the ancient world... Uh, many of them, were people who were castrated in order to be given a role of government responsibility and put in charge of the most important things in the government. They were to work for the king and be responsible for entire areas of responsibility like the treasury or uh, so on. And they were the ones who had been given significant responsibility, like I say, the most significant of which was the harem, the king's bed. They were the keepers of the bed. For the king. Now the thing about eunuchs. Is while they were given these incredible responsibilities as government officials. They were never actually trusted by people. Because they didn't fit the categories. See in the ancient world. 
masculinity was assumed to be the perfection of humanity. In Latin, the word for male is related to the word for strength, which is virility, and it's related to the word for character, which is virtue. A male is someone who is strong and virtuous with character. The word for woman means, is related to the word for soft, which also means weak, which is assumed to mean weak of character. Right? Women are soft and they have weak character. Men are strong and have solid character. And so in the ancient world, the goal as a man was to be a man's man. It was to be a guy's guy with the, the beard and the muscles and the swagger and the voice and anything that exuded testosterone to prove to the world that you were strong and therefore of reputable character. The thing about a eunuch was that he was clearly supposed to be a man, but he had this softness to him that made people suspect his character. And so the kings would often think, I don't know if I can really trust this guy with my women or my money or my power or my reputation. And so they, they, the eunuchs were despised. They weren't trusted. They were feared because they always reminded these guys, guys, that that masculinity can actually be taken away. And so guys were actually kind of afraid of eunuchs lest they become like them and lose their standing as men in the community. In Israel, eunuchs were despised, number one, because they couldn't fulfill their sacred duty of getting married and having kids. You know, what kind of person can't live up to the basic responsibility that God has placed on humanity, which is to have a family? Secondly, the Jewish law said that eunuchs were not even allowed in the temple. God doesn't even want you to come to church if you're a eunuch. The word eunuch became the butt of a joke. The way we would say in the 21st century, inappropriately I might add, oh, you throw like a girl. In the first century they would say, what do you have, bare arms? What, can't you grow a beard? And they were all eunuch jokes as a way of saying you're not really a man. You're something less. And Jesus says, you know what I'd like? Rather than having us posturing for position and rather than having us striving to attain a certain status so that we can have access to the rights and privileges that come along with that status, you know what I'd rather happen? I'd rather we just give up the categories altogether. Right? The eunuch was a figure that didn't fit the categories. He wasn't totally male, but he wasn't entirely female either. He was uncategorizable. When you looked at the role that he played, he didn't conform to the male gender roles, but he didn't conform to the female gender roles either. He was uncategorizable. He was absolutely outside of the categories, kind of a category all on his own and despised for it. And here's what I think Jesus is saying, three things to us. Number one, how about we give up the categories? How about we live as people who live outside of the categories? People for whom the categories are irrelevant and not descriptors of who we really are. How about we stop categorizing and ranking ourselves based on gender or based on race? How about we stop categorizing and ranking ourselves based on spiritual maturity or wealth or health or youth or age or orientation or whatever the case may be? How about we stop using all these categories to define our fundamental identity? Now, you are those things and God has made you those things and celebrate those things and embrace those things because that's who you are. That's who God has made you to be. And yet, and yet, how about we not allow those things to be the fundamental defining characteristic of our identity? How about we live in the way that we view ourselves outside of categories? Stop judging ourselves for being this and not that. How about we live outside of the categories in the way that we view each other, right? Instead of Instead of looking down on people that you have judged to be something less because of the categories that you've ascribed to them. Or looking up to somebody because you've judged yourself to be something less because of how the categories you ascribe to yourself. How about we just do away with the categories? How about we be the people in between who have no category whatsoever and we stop judging each other for the categories? How about that? And Jesus is saying, if we're going to live without categories, then instead of trying to move up to the top, why don't we be content, like a eunuch, to move ourselves down to the bottom, to be the ones who are despised and who are nothing, who are lowly, who have who've kind of positioned everybody else above them so that you have no choice but to look up to everybody else. 
I think this is what Jesus means when he says that people choose to live like eunuchs, to be despised instead of seeking honor, to live outside of the categories, who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is saying, how about we propose this category as the one defining category that you're allowed to have define your identity. You love God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And you love everybody else as much as you love yourself. That's the value system of the kingdom of heaven. How about we allow ourselves to drop all the other categories. And instead of trying to climb our way to the top, we position ourselves down at the bottom in order to take our place in the community of somebody whose fundamental identity is that we love God with everything we have and everything we are. And we love everybody else as much as we love ourselves. How would our community change? if we drop the labels as they pertain to other people, as we drop the labels as they pertain to us. And instead of trying to posture ourselves at the top, we're content to take our spot at the bottom and just be somebody who gets out of bed in the morning to love God with everything we have and to love each other with all we've got. You know what that's called? It's called the church. And it's the community that God has created us to be. The community with no cool kids. Let's pray. God, comparison is such a human thing. It's just, I think, endemic to the human condition to try and figure out where we fit and who we're above and who we're below. To pray this prayer, right? Thank God you didn't make me a woman or a slave or a Gentile. God, we repent of all the ways that we would fill in those blanks. May you make us those who only, when we look at each other, only care about one category, human being, which means you deserve to be loved. When we look at ourselves, we only know one category, human being, which means we are loved. And then we just live to love each other as human beings, because you have loved us in Jesus Christ, who makes it all possible. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.